January 14th, 2023, and we have a very special guest on the show today, Dr. Tommy J. Curry. Dr. Curry is a scholar, author, and professor. Dr. Curry is currently a professor of philosophy and holds the personal chair of Africana philosophy and black male studies at the University of Edinburgh. His research uh, interests are 19th century ethnology, critical race theory, and black male studies. Dr. Curry is the author of The Man Not Race, Class, Genre, and the Dilemmas of Black Manhood, which won the 2018 American Book Award. And he's also the author of Another White Man's Burden, uh, Josiah Royce's Quest for a Philosophy of Racial Empire, which won the Josiah Royce Prize for American Idealist uh, Thought. Dr. Curry has also republished the Forgotten Philosophical Works of William Ferris as a philosophical treatise of William H. Ferris, selected readings from, from the African abroad for his evolution in Western civilization. In 2019, uh, he became the editor of the first book series dedicated to the study of black males entitled Black Male Studies, a series exploring the paradoxes of racially subjugated males. Uh, Dr. Curry has written numerous um, at least over 50, in my estimation, um, scholarly articles um, and publications and, and a wide range of, of media outlets. Dr. Curry's research has recognized the, uh, has been recognized by Diverse as placing him among the top 15 emerging scholars in the United States in 2018. His public intellectual work earned him the Society for the Advancement of American Philosophy Allen Locke Award in 2017, and Dr. Curry is the past president, uh, president of Philosophy Born of Struggle, one of the oldest philosophy organizations in the United States. Well, Dr. Curry, I could go on and on about uh, all of your scholarship, um, but I, I want to thank you for coming on the show and, and learn from you directly. Uh, welcome to the show. No, thank you so much for the invitation. Well, as a frequent guest of our show is, uh, is Gerald Horn. Um, whose work, uh, among many other many many th other topics, um, has debunked the creation myth of the founding of of the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, in a similar vein, I wanted to talk to you about the creation myths related to the feminist movement. Um, can you discuss the foundation of the feminist movement in the U.S.? Was it a what is was it as progressive of a movement as we are taught in the mainstream? Um, mm -hmm. And what was its relationship to a to emancipation of enslaved Africans? No, thanks for the question. I mean, you know, it's, it's difficult coming on a platform to even talk about history, intellectual history next to someone like Gerald Horn. So, uh, you know, I, I take that with uh, the full responsibility that it bears. Uh, let me say, I, I think a lot of people, when we investigate the history of feminism, we see it as a progressive movement that seeks to expand the borders of democracy. So next to the, the enslavement of black people, there's this kind of analogy that, that white women were enslaved because they were women. Uh, and while that grew in the mid 19th century between black people who were enslaved fighting for the elimination of slavery uh, in Seneca Falls and the debates over women's rights, the primary foundation of feminism as we know it today, where women are a minority category that set separately oppressed and differently oppressed than other groups of racialized people is a very, very recent 20th century invention. In the 19th century, when we're talking about women's rights, we're talking about labor rights. We're talking about women and employment rights, and of course, the right to vote. Now, the right to vote during the 19th century was not this kind of liberal right that we have today, where we think that everyone should have the right to vote because it's what equal people do. The right to vote in the 19th century was much more about the right to rule over certain groups of people. So debates around the question of suffrage and enfranchisement revolved around the rational nature, the civilizational nature, the kind of cognitive development that white men and white women had and how, how other darker races did or did not have the same kind of intellectual and cultural status as whites. <clears throat> so what we often do is we talk about suffrage is something denied to women generally without understanding specifically that the right of suffrage was the right to rule over other groups of people. 
Now, this is important because after the Civil War, you now have free Black people, free Black men and women. And the question of enfranchisement now becomes a question of whether or not Black men, after dying and fighting in the Civil War, should have the right to rule over themselves and other white people. Feminist authors like Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, suggested that it was a bad idea to have a man's government. Now, we traditionally understand this within feminist language as saying, well, this is a patriarchal government, a government of men to rule over all women. That's not exactly what they meant. When you look at the language and the writings of the revolution and the various periodicals that they published in, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony were very specific. They meant by a man's government that if you have an only enfranchised men, you will end up enfranchising racialized men, black men, Asian men, who are truly savages, who are barbarous. And those groups of men, because they're uneducated, because they're not as civilized as white people, will now get to dictate and determine the lives and well-beings of white women. This is why the white suffragists actually supported what they called educated suffrage, or the idea that educated white men and educated white women should be the ones that were enfranchised and had the right to make the rules of civilization for everyone else. Now, because educated suffrage is, of course, an elitist project, as something that falls that black people were fundamentally denied since they were just emancipated, it automatically excludes black people from having the right to vote. So when you look at the debates throughout the history of suffrage, volumes one, two, three, the debate is not over equality. It is not about women being equal to men. It is about white women not being ruled by savage groups of men who are not Anglo-Saxon and white. So the idea that this is about women's equality is really an ahistorical myth within the history of America. What we're speaking about is a certain kind of racial logic, which says that white people are more evolved than every other group of people in the world. And now for the first time since the emancipation of enslaved Africans, you have white women and white ethnologists who were racial scientists during the 1800s debating whether or not black men were man enough to have manhood rights of citizenship, which included the right to vote. So for the, on the racial side, black men proving that they desire to be free and should be citizens came with the question, are they actually men such that citizenship allows them to vote and to be free, to rule over others? White women said the African, the black man is truly a savage. He's a barbarous beast that rapes women, that abuses women, that will pose a threat to women because he is not a patriarch. He has no chivalry. It is not within him to care for women like white Anglo-Saxon men do. As such, they suggested that the black man should not be given the right to vote. You should give it to the white woman because the white woman is the only one who can guarantee the further development of white evolution, white democracy, and white civilization. So people like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony writing in the revolution, which was funded by a pro-slaver, uh, George Francis Train, suggested that if you give black men the right to vote, they're going to destroy the white race. So we have a responsibility to protect it. That debate is what is often overlooked, uh, overshadowed by liberal ideology and language, um, and doesn't purely and seriously investigate the role that ethnology or the science of race during that period of time, the role that ethnological science played in justifying the arguments that white suffragettes were making about black male savagery. Ethnology was a science that was predicated on the idea that you can measure the evolution and developmental stage of different races based on the accomplishments of its men. So it's, if you were an ethnologist, you're looking at what are the great feats of the men of a particular race and what does that indicate about the racial temperament and evolutionary stage of that group of people. Because black men were taken as the standard within this white ethnological taxonomy, black men were always on the chopping block their temperament, their political attitudes, their proclivities towards rape and sexual assault, their proclivities to domestic abuse, whether or not they can take care of families. All of these things were discussed amongst white suffragettes, which is why people like Phoebe Cousins, for instance, said, I have taken lots of time and studied the Negro, and the black man is more barbarous and evil, more brutish than the white male slave owner ever was.
So within the feminist movement, the early suffragette movement, there's the idea by white women that the fact that black men are animalistic and brutish and that slavery only degraded their situation, that they're fundamentally unfit to rule homes, rule families, or hold the ballot because ultimately they're fundamentally misogynistic and violent. You see, this part of the characterization of black men and the fact that this exists within the debates in the history of suffrage is often overlooked. That's why I find that it's most appropriate to say that when we're speaking about the actual writings of white feminists or white suffragettes during the 19th century, it's more accurate to think of the educated suffrage movement and the writings that come out in the revolution as a backlash to the idea of black male enfranchisement, which was one off the back of their participation in the Civil War. Thank you for explaining all that. And, and can you say more about the role of white women during the time of slavery? Oh, I mean, there's so much. <laughs> there's so much. Uh, you know, over the re over the last few years, there's been an explosion of research. Um, you know, Stephanie uh, Jones's book, uh, they were her property, showing that 40% of slave owning peoples uh, in the United States were white women. The people that owned 40% of the people that owned slaves were women, white women. Uh, there's, of course, the work by, you know, Thomas Foster documenting uh, how white women raped and sexually abused black men during slavery. Uh, we also see some of this in, you know, Lamont Ado's work, you know, looking at Brazil. Uh, my work, of course, traces this 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 uh, time period as well, looking at some of the literature that you find, you know, Linda Brent's narrative, some of the work of, of Grimke, where he's documenting that black men were constantly talking about the, the sexual assault and violence that white women uh, perpetrated and imposed upon them. So, so what we have now is a historiographic moment where many of the uh, ideologies, the political theories that we thought grew out of a freedom movement in the United States really were part and parcel of an insidious anti-Black and misandric movement, meaning that it was not only the issue of racial inferiority that was driving the idea that white women thought they were more evolved and more rightfully deserving to rule over other people than newly freed Black people and Black men specifically, but it's also us trying to understand, well, then what is it about the targeting of Black men? Why is it that these white women are not just making arguments about the inferiority of Black people, they're specifically making arguments and charges about black men's misogyny or what we would call misogyny or hatred of women. The idea that because black men are primitive, that ultimately their only understanding of women's or women's rights is about sexual access, that giving black men, this is Rebecca Lattimore Felton, right? Giving black men the ballot forces them to be convinced of the idea, the, the mistaken idea that they're men like white men and this will under, ultimately allow them to ravage white men's daughters. So we have to lynch a thousand thousand of them a week to deter them from their natural inclination to rape, right? So white women were part and parcel of the cultural and scientific and ethnological structure of how debates about gender and racial freedom were actually happening in the United States. What we often do is we talk about the 19th century as if it's this kind of fleeting thing. It was a lot of pseudoscience, a lot of mistaken racial ideology without actually reading the text and trying to understand what is meant by certain arguments advanced by suffragettes or even what we take to be the foreshadows of modern liberals. The idea that black people were inferior in the 19th century ethnology started from their reading of the Bible. So after the diluvian epic or you know, the great flood you know, from Noah's, you know, Noah's Ark story, uh, that's how God created races. The original, the first ethnologists were debating, at least in America, in the UK and Britain uh, and Germany it was different, but at least in America, the, the argument is that the Negro was an animal. So since the Negro was not a man, he was herded on the ship in a pair, just like you would giraffes or monkeys or tigers or anything else. So the debate by ethnologists in the 19th century, this is antebellum, right, ethnology, before the birth, before it's influenced by Darwinism, is really trying to assess the bestial character of, of, of Black people. And this is an important distinction because remember, in antebellum ethnological text in science, the idea is that man was given the dominion by God to rule over all other animals and beasts in the world. The ethnologists thought if they can prove that the Negro or that the black race was more bestial and was like a beast, it explained and justified the divine order of enslavement. Now, as you move past the 1830s and 40s and get to the post-Civil War era, 
Now ethnology sees itself as a serious science because it's more interested in the evolutionary nature and character of how races develop. This is especially important because you have white women who are defining themselves as women precisely because they're part of a race that has evolved sexual distinctions and sex roles. Now, this didn't exist for Black people. Remember, Black people were still thought to be beasts of burden. So there was no such thing as a Black man who was masculine and a Black woman who was feminine. These are largely aspirations that can only be held by the white race. So before, actually, before I started writing on this topic, um, I knew of very few philosophers or intellectual historians that were paying attention to the fact that the ideas of masculinity and womanhood that we're dealing with are actually not to be found in the black race. So you can talk about, you know, like Spillers, of course, does. You can talk about the ungendered nature of enslavement, but the, the issue is that there's no gender to start with. The gender was a very specific articulation or category that was produced by the evolutionary trajectory of the white Anglo-Saxon race in America. Other races or ethnic groups didn't have that same formulation. So black people are then being engaged with by white women who, because they're part of the white race, are already more masculine. To be, to be white was to evolve in a masculine energy, a masculine form. You can see this discussed even in De Gobineau, how masculine energy generates civilization and feminine energy is more passive, submissive, and more likely to be ruled over. So in the ethnological sense, white women were extremely masculine compared to the men of every other race because they thought that their whiteness gives them the foundation and the civilizational right by God to rule over everyone else. And this is why I think someone like Stephanie Jones, uh, you know, uh, Roger Jones' book is so important because it shows that this was not only a theoretical lens to look at the 19th century way, but it was actually protected by the courts. The courts protected white women to own slaves and rule over lesser peoples in their view because they thought that it was God given a contractual right to do so. Black people didn't have that kind of power because coming out of enslavement, all the arguments for rights were aspirational. The, the arguments by Douglas was under the same conditions, the black race can develop a manhood. This is what Anna Julia Cooper says in 1892, that our race is at the very beginning of a ruddy manhood. And the reason that this language is being used is because manhood indicates the civilizational stage where you can do things like have the right to self-determine, rule yourself through government, or in this case, vote. So white women were engineering a kind of rhetoric and movement based in the idea that they were more masculine and more powerful to justify why they should rule and have the right to vote over black men in the mid 19th century. And this is a very insidious program of racial logics because everything that they're drawing this from is either linked to guys to the presumed right that guy gave the white race to rule over every other darker race or the idea that white women were more evolved hence they had a claim to rule the world next to white men and you really see this take off in the 1890s when someone like charlotte gilman in her book women in economics starts discussing how white women actually created patriarchy right um and the are these issues of anti-blackness and, and anti anti-men um within the feminist movement only specific to the 19th century no no it moves it moves well throughout the 20th century so you know i think i think what often happens is the whitewashing of history allows feminism as an intellectual discipline to account for its racism only to the extent by which it doesn't include black women so when we look at the, the, the historical development of feminism, we say, well, feminism was non-inclusive. And what we mean by that is not that it, it didn't include the issues of black people, but it didn't include the issues of black women and other women of color, right? The problem with that is it presumes that the universal pattern of male subjugation holds across all male groups. So the idea is that the black man's an oppressor, the Asian male's an oppressor, the indigenous man's an oppressor, all the men are all oppressing women. And it's interesting that that becomes the debate at the early, at the early part of the 20th century, even amongst feminist texts, because you have to remember, this is still the era of imperialism and colonialism. This is still the era of Jim Crowism and reconstruction. So the idea that you can get a white woman in America making the argument that she's oppressed by the men that she owns or that she's segregated from on the basis of their racial inferiority becomes almost laughable, which is why the work during that period of time isn't discussing white women's equality to black men or to men generally. 
It's talking about their equality in relationship to the project of white supremacy. So if I can go back to Charlotte Gilman for a moment in her book, Women in Economics, Gilman makes the argument in 1892 that the white man was too individualistic, too capitalistic, and didn't have any kind of race consciousness. So he was a bad, in her words, he was a bad white supremacist and a bad patriarch because he didn't know how to care for the other white members of his race. But because God gave white women the maternal gift where women naturally care for things, the white woman had to retreat into the home so that the white man can take care of her and his children. And through the generations, the white woman taught the white man how to become a more maternal figure. So in creating nuclear families, which, she, which Charlotte Gilman thought was the highest form of civilization, it socialized white men to create a racial ethic and kinship that protected all white people against all other groups of people. And see, this is interesting because in the mind of this specific feminist thinker, who she was, and she was touted as one of the leading feminist theor theorists of the late 19th and early 20th century, even by in places like the New York Times, and she traveled even up into uh, the 1930s, she was given, you know, book talks in London and throughout Europe. Her argument was, in order for white men to rule the world as white supremacist patriarchs and to exterminate all the darker races that challenged them, it was necessary for them to be taught by white women. Her only issue was, well, now that white men have grown to be the imperialist patriarchs that we have evolved them to be by making them care for us, the white woman has fulfilled her evolutionary duty and it is now her right to leave the home and join him side by side as a white supremacist imperial leader. So people always talk about, you know, the yellow wallpaper when they think about Charlotte Gilman, but they don't understand the context. The issue is white women being oppressed by the home, not because they should be free individuals, but because they have a right to now partake in the plunder and exploitation of the darker races next to the white male. So this, the whole way that we framed female equality and inequality in the home as a place of oppression is, is presupposed, is contextualized within a world of imperial domination where the home became the locus of creating white imperialism. And now that they've evolved past that because they own the world, they're setting up colonies, the white woman is oppressed because she can now not partake in the kind of patriarchal uh, surplus that she's created. So Black people are being framed as savage, barbarous and inferior precisely because their homes don't look like white homes. And this is, this is a moment in the 20th century that I think is so important for us to understand. When you have people like E. Franklin Frazier writing on the Negro family, he's not doing that study just because he's interested in black families. He's doing that study because the overall trajectory of American sociology and anthropology takes the family as the basis of political economy and governmentality. So the idea that you have black people who want to rule, specifically black men who are claiming that they are free and should enjoy the right to vote, not being able to run a home because they're not patriarchal, they're street men, are they thugs, are they not good fathers, are they absentee, right? There's lots of different words in the early 1900s that you know white sociologists use and describe black males. All that points to the fact that there was an apatriarchality that justified black men not having a political or social role that allowed them to exercise full democratic freedoms. Whereas the white family, because it was patriarchal and nuclear, allowed both white men and white women to have a role in the racial development of the group over, or the white group over these darker races. So what we do is we end up talking about feminism saying, oh, feminism is about equality. It's not about, you know, anti, you know, it's not anti-male, et cetera. And there's an argument to that. It's certainly not anti-white male, right? Because most of the people that are arguing about white suffrage are saying that they're comrades, that they're the compatriots of white men on this move to rule the rest of the world. But where it falls short is pulling out this insidious racist history where all these feminist authors and these white sociologists that are studying families are doing so by depicting black men as being outside the home and on the street, and then black women having to take up what, you know, this kind of matriarchal role, right, in the black, in the black community because black men are absent. See, these are all caricatures of white, white, white racist and white supremacist ideology. It's not the case that black people weren't trying to keep families together. It's not the case that black men didn't participate in families. It's not 
not the case that black women were matriarchs that were emasculating black men. These are all the fantasies of the white imagination and white sociological projection of the inferiority of black people in comparison to their group. But the role that feminism plays in that somehow has been completely erased. Now, even when you move over to the 19, now that's the 1920s and 30s, when you move to the 1940s and 50s, you see the same kind of practices. People like Helen Hacker, who wrote the essay, Woman is Minority Group, made the argument that we can actually understand how ma white masculinity operates to oppress women based on how the Negro is treated. So notice, this is a white feminist, very much in the same vein as Simone de Beauvoir, trying to figure out what womanhood actually means but they're utilizing white womanhood as the standard and they're defining the suffering of white womanhood, not on the basis of white women complaining or writing about their oppression, but by making an analogy to how black people, specifically black men are treated in the society. So her essay is so blatant because she actually has a chart where she says the woman in the Negro, she says the Negro is oppressed because the Negro has a place, a woman has a place. The Negro is ridiculed for how they dress. The woman is ridiculed for how she dress. So it's this kind of basic, you know, um, Angelistic logic, right? That's generating what we think of as the gender category. So when you say black men are a threat to women or black men don't experience sexism or black men are not, you know, don't know what it means to be a woman, it's really ahistorical because black men were thought to be the first women of the races. It's on their, it's the it's the feminine nature, their savage, their emotionalism, their lack of rationality that was the basis for how white women actually made womanhood a racial category. And I want to be clear here. This is so pronounced that even in other essays written by Hacker, who, you know, kind of generates his theory of women as minority group, she refers to black men as bisexual. She says that black men have both maternal and paternal characteristics that drive the psychological and ego-driven de uh, development of white people in America. So this isn't some kind of rhetorical theory. This is a idea that is generating psychoanalytic and sociological principles that are showing how the races interact and how the contact between blackness and whiteness actually is part of the, the growing and evolving psyche of the white American. So feminism is always extricated from this kind of relationship. The role that white women played in developing theories of the black family, the role that white women played in protecting the white family from integration or desegregation during the period of time, the conservatism of white women that allowed them to uh, petition for white women's rights by joining organizations like the, w, the women's Ku Klux Klan. These are all examples historically of how white women saw their ability to rule as a white person as a gendered phenomena of the white race, not of their body. So it's the masculine position of the white race in the 19th and 20th century that allowed them to rule over black people without question. The, the fact that a white woman has a feminine gender is just an accident in relationship to a white man. It means nothing when you're actually comparing the white group to the black group because that is a fundamentally masculine dynamic that gives white people the divine or at least political power to rule over all the darker races, not only domestically in the United States, but internationally, as we know, with the with the ruling of colonialism and imperialism. And when when did black men first get labeled as patriarchs and why is this important to this discussion? Wow. Well, in, in my research, you know, I have not found a single reference to black men as patriarchs until we get to black feminism. Now, that's a really, really important historiographic moment because prior to the 1970s and 80s, Black men were defined by most feminine, white feminist writers as not being patriarchal and only aspiring to white masculinity. And if I could draw a few distinctions there. So one of the earliest texts that tries to describe black men as wanting to imitate white manhood um, is actually the text by uh, Shulamit Firestone, The Dialectics of Sex. And in that book, she has a chapter de dedicated to like racist family or racist sex. I forget the specific title. But in that, in that piece, she makes two dis primary distinctions. She says, look, because the black man has no real power in society and doesn't have a masculinity or manhood of which we can actually speak, he, he seeks to imitate the white man. And in doing so, he can basically castrate himself. He can overcompensate by being a street man or a pimp, right? 
or he can be the child of a white man. So then she says that's why the relationship between the white man and the black man is one of father to son, where he has to accept the basis of white masculinity or else he becomes a eunuch, okay? Uh, she said that the, the black man then fundamentally suffers from an Oedipal complex. And, and it's interesting to me because during this period of time, which would be like the 1970s, or even as early as the 1940s and 50s, you see with someone like, um, you know, John Dollard. Uh, well, that's the 30, that's 39. So yeah, 40s, 50s, right? You, you see white people making the argument that black people suffered inferiority complex and aim to be like their oppressor. But the only time that you see this kind of argument being made is usually in the colonial circumstance where you say oppressed people or African people, because they're savages, view you white colonizers as saviors or as parents. And this creates a dependency relationship where the savage people want to learn from their colonizers, so they try to imitate them. This whole idea of imitation comes about through an extremely insidious right, racial logic drawn up through colonialism. By the time you get to the 50s and 60s, you see white thinkers experimenting with this idea right, is things like culture of poverty, right, arguments by Oscar Lewis, where he's talking about how poor black and brown people overcompensate and become hyper-masculine because they really don't have masculinity. Or you see it in subculture violence theories that say that because black men are Negro masculinity is deformed and it doesn't have any power or capital, it looks towards sexual aggression and violence to make up for its meaning, right? These feminists are influenced by these kinds of ideas. So when you get Shumi Firestone writing the dialect of sex in 1970, you get Susan Brown Miller writing against uh, against rape um, in in 75. Right, her book she's uses subculture violence theory. This is how black men are being depicted by feminist theorists that they have a compensatory masculinity, and this is a very important historical term because this idea is introduced by white criminologists. And it's taken up by people who are doing both psychological studies, like when you look at protest psychosis, and it's being taken up by sociologists to describe the cultural milieu by which racial oppression creates an erratic and schizophrenic, dangerous black male. So black male militancy, black male civil rights leadership was all given to this idea of schizophrenia. The ways that black men operated in relationships as well as in their homes was all based on subculture of violence or compensatory masculinity theory. So the kinds of violence that you see white sociologists and social scientists ascribing on black men and boys can directly be traced to how they're trying to explain male and female relationships and rates of violence perpetrated by black men compared to white men within between racial groups. So the theory of gender that we're dealing with today, this idea of toxic masculinity, this idea of hyper masculinity, these were the very same terms that were developed in this debate of culture of poverty, subculture of violence, and compensatory masculinity, which was the dominant framing of gender for poor Black people during the 1960s and 70s. By the time you get to the 1980s, and you get books like The Second Assault by, by Williams and Holmes, this is, you just have a full-on racist onslaught. The idea is that Black men have no power. Civil rights may have given them a little bit of power, but ultimately, they focus their full uh, power of their identity on their penises, which is why they're rapists. So you have people like Williams and Holmes coming out with statements saying something like, black men are patriarchs, but they try to imitate white male violence through the act of rape. So the act of raping minority women, they're trying to actually imitate white men. And this was the dominant theory, not only amongst criminologists, but even someone like Lynn A. Curtis, who was part of the urban housing authorities in Washington, DC during this period of time. So black, black male crime, was being black masculinity, crime, victimization, rape, domestic violence, was all being explained through a theory or a framework of pathology that linked poverty, exploitation, the history of colonialism and savagery to what we think produces black male deviance in the contemporary American society during the 1970s and 80s. So feminism was part of that conversation. It's feminist authors, people who claim that they're feminist authors trying to understand the relationship between domestic violence, rape, deviance, crime, et cetera, and how that's all located within the psyche and the masculinity of poor urban black men. 
And, and what has the sort of the empirical data shown about the levels of violence against black men um, uh, in general, like in terms of inter intimate partner violence, domestic violence mm -hmm. and, and other areas? And even, even I've heard you talk about um, uh, black children or black male children in, in foster mm -hmm. care and, and what we call the family yeah. policing system. Well, the, the first thing we have to understand is, is that violence is an ecological phenomenon. And what I mean by that is violence is based on your environment, your neighborhood, your level of poverty, your exposure to violence, right? We have we have lots of studies. I mean, I mean, even the studies that are done on white people, right? And family conflict study. Lots of studies that show children who are spanked, children who are deprived, children that have substance abuse issues, issues of alcoholism, all have a higher probability of interpersonal conflict and, and, and both uh, perpetrating into a partner violence and being victim to it, right? So we know that there are environmental factors. But when we speak about Black people, somehow all the science goes out the window and we reduce all violence in the Black community to bad Black men. The data doesn't support that. So the first data source, so the sur first survey of domestic violence in the United States at a national level was done in 1976. In that study, it showed that Black men were disproportionately victims of intimate partner homicide. So if you look up the FBI supplements, you know, from the 1990s, as well as like the early, uh, the Bureau, the BGS data on intimate partner violence uh, that was written in 2000, you'll see them go back to 76 all the way to like the mid 2000s. That shows that Black men, I think, roughly from 1976 to 1994-ish, 1993, 94-ish, were the primary victims, the, made, the the predominant victims of intimate partner homicide in the Black community. Now, to this day, and I've gone through even more studies than when I initially wrote this fact in the book, The Man Nine, I, there is no explanation. The only explanation I can find about Black men being killed by their spouses comes from Wolfgang and Farrah Cootie, where they argue that because Black men were not patriarchs and ran home, Black women actually were in charge of them. And because Black women have more power in the home than the Black male, she sometimes disciplined him with violence. And that's that's what they used to explain why so many more Black men were being killed by their spouses than Black men killing their wives, which was the pattern of violence amongst white people. So, and I, I say that to say, not because their argument is true, but it points out the ways that the racist logic operates. If you start with the view that black men are not men and that black men are not patriarchs, then it stands to configure that you can explain their deviancy and their victimization by the fact that they're not really powerful men. So because they're weak men, they have compensatory masculinity, which is why they steal, they cheat, they lie, they abuse, and they rape. And it's also the reason for why they're victimized, killed, and abused within their homes. You see the same kind of ethnographic assertions made by something like Tally's Corner. He goes into you know a, a black urban neighborhood, starts interviewing black men on the streets, looks at their families. He he documents high levels of domestic abuse against men, and of course, but his interpretation is well. When I talk to him, he he has an interview where he's talking to this one woman. I think her name is Lorinda. All right, at least that's what he names her in the book. And she had, he asked, well, why did you beat your husband? Right, and she's like, well, because he's not a man. She's like, I challenged him. I said mean things to him. I expected him to hit me and put me in my place as a, a real man would do. And he went into the room and started crying. Now, there's a whole lot, there's a whole lot of racist assumptions in Tally's corner. By no means am I trying to use that as an authoritative text. But it's interesting to me that the same patterns we see of domestic violence in the first national survey in 76 is also established in the ethnographic kind of accounts of, of black family conflicts by white sociologists you know, through the 50s and 60s. The issue is you had a bidirectional pattern of violence, meaning that black men would hit women, black women would hit men. There was a, a rotating cycle of violence within these communities because they're poor, neglected, segregated, et cetera. And, we, and white people, white social scientists used a, race, used a racist logic to explain that. What we have today is all the evidence we need, at least from the national survey, to understand that dominant patterns of violence that held in white communities, where you have white men predominantly beating white women, Right. And that's and that's certainly been challenged recently. Right. In the last 20 years. But that was the dominant framework that we were, were looking at didn't exist from the very beginning when you looked at black communities. Right. So what that means is that you have huge number of black male victims in the 1990s. There's publications saying that, um, you know, where, where public health scholars are and clinicians are saying they think that the number of black male victims 
of domestic violence are the same as uh, black female victims in the community. You have um, the NISVS data going back to, I mean, God, that stuff's over a decade early, old now, but you have at least 10, 20 years of uh, NISVS data that's showing the same kind of patterns where you see extremely high levels of female perpetrated victimization against men and disproportionately high levels of men victimizing women. That's to say that when you look at a complicated issue like domestic violence in the black community that's based on histories of, of violence and alcoholism and substance abuse and segregation, et cetera, you can't reduce it down to these simple feminist tropes like patriarchy. In fact, people like Ellen Pence, who was one of the co-creators of the idea of the Duluth model, the idea that men abuse women for patriarchal power actually retracted what she said. She said she made it up and there was no clinical evidence to support it. She said that when, even when you looked at the clinic, the people coming into her uh, treatment center, she excluded lesbian violence, same sex violence, right? And of course, you know, same sex groups have some of the highest rates of intimate partner violence in the United States. She excluded uh, female perpetrators who were attacking the men. She excluded the men who were extremely regretful and sorry for what they did. Right. And she's like they, they deliberately excluded all these cases that could interrupt their theory. So what we've often done now as, as scholars, as people who are woke, who are trying to participate in contemporary cultural contestations of violence against women and debate is we simply say, well, look, patriarchy causes X. It's unquestionable. We don't need to look at data. We will just say that men abuse because of patriarchy. Well, because there are higher rates of domestic abuse in poorer communities and in racial and ethnic minority communities, be they black, brown, or indigenous, what then do you say about those men? Inevitably, the consequence is, well, those men are fighting for patriarchy. They're hyper-masculine. And you see automatically how that brings you back to the same kind of arguments of compensatory masculinity that were being debated in the 1960s and 70s. You're trying to explain racial variants or a higher rate of prevalence or incident in a black or brown community, not on the basis of environmental factors, but on the fact that these men want more power. So they're a hyper masculine. They can't be real men like white men. So they abuse their women more than the white race does so they can get more power. See, it's these kind of reductionistic and simplistic tropes that operate throughout the liberal arts and humanist fields in the United States academies and universities that become impervious to epidemiological evidence or clinical, uh, clinical uh, counterexamples. So rather than actually investigate kind of the racist history and logic that was set in motion by these kinds of gender and sexual tropes about compensatory masculinity and hypermasculinity, we retreat automatically into the idea of a dangerous brown or black man. And that becomes, that gains all the explanatory force we have for looking at contemporary problems and disproportionate rates of violence that are perpetrated against different groups of people. It's a really insidious program because the exact same arguments that pro-slavery and ethnologists used in, during the 19th century, they said black, if you let black men out of slavery, they will inevitably rape and abuse women and children. It's the same arguments that you have contemporary feminists making when they say black and brown men are threats and black and brown men abuse women and children and other sexual minorities in their communities for power. See, there's no evidence of it because when you look at, when you actually look at any of the data and like, let's say I wanted to look at who has the highest rate of say 12 months prevalence for uh, intimate partner violence. Well, that's not gonna be black and brown men, right? That's actually gonna be uh, lesbian, uh, same sex loving women, right, in America. They have a higher prevalence. Same thing with bisexual men, et cetera, right? It varies because it's an environmental problem, but we don't study it that way. We hear the problem of intimate partner violence, we think black or brown men, right? Because they're the most violent. You see the idea that's been generated about them being a threat to women holds so much weight from the 19th century that we won't even entertain that there are other causal or correlative explanations for why high rates of violence happen in these communities. But when you modify it for class, right? When you take people out of certain environments, the rates of domestic violence go down. So if, if the argument is that black men are just violent because of their black masculinity, why then do black men who are in these other environments not perpetrate similar rates of violence? Why do these black women who are outside of these environments not perpetrate, perpetrate these, these, these kinds of violence? Child abuse goes down, intimate partner, partner violence committed by women goes down, interpersonal conflict goes down, right? You see these, we, we, we've, we've bought into a certain kind of gender reductionism and essentialism that makes black maleness or racialized maleness the culprit for so many social problems that when we see a social problem, it automatically becomes the causal element in our thinking. And when we go back and look at the history of how this was constructed, 
And a lot, like I said, a lot of this is racist sociology, racist criminology. But race, but white feminism was also part of racist criminology and white <laughs> racist uh, white racist sociology. And somehow that all gets ignored. And I mean, it's it's so blatant that you can literally pull, you can pick off Susan Brown Miller's book Against Our Will. You could pull, um, you know, Williams and Harrington uh, and Holmes the Sack of the Soul. You can pull the dialectics of sex. You could pull Millet's work, Kate Mills' work. This is all widely discussed. You could pull Sylvia Walby's work on these issues. It's, it's, not, it's not outside the historical record, but rather just like how people removed white women from photos of lynching, right, during, the, the, during Reconstruction, this is what has happened when we talk about feminism. We talk about feminism as an ever-expanding liberal discourse that incorporates and includes everyone. And that the issue for black men is to give up their patriarchal ideations so that they can become a true human. But then when you look at the patterns of violence, the rates of child abuse committed by white women, black women, brown women, et cetera, et cetera, in similar impoverished conditions. When you look at the rates of intimate partner violence, intimate partner homicide of these groups of women compared to their men and, their, and white women, higher rates. Nobody, nobody says that those forms of violence actually define their group. Nobody says that the category of womanhood is married to that kind of violence. And mind you, the very category of womanhood that we're talking about, which is white womanhood, generally speaking, when we're talking about the history of racism and feminism, we're talking about white women, that's been linked to colonialism, genocides, and some of the most ridiculous writings justifying the elimination of the darker races for almost two centuries. So how is it that the deviance of less than 1% of a population. So we're talking about intimate partner homicide, violence against women. If we're talking about a black race, you're talking about 250 to 290 deaths in a year. Now that's down from the 70s because in the 70s, black men were being killed over 600 per year. So when you talk about domestic violence, intimate partner homicide amongst black people in a given year, black men are killing black women, roughly 250 to 290 depending on the year. Black women kill black men 150, 180 depending. Okay, that's what we're discussing. Now you say that those incidents right, which are based in impoverishment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right, depravity, urban issues, unemployment, recidivism, in and out of jail, all these things, that defines the temperament of a whole race of people, a whole group of people. So black men are defined by the worst of their group. But then you look at the history of white women from, imper from enslavement, imperialism, colonialism, arguing for genocide, their participation in racist criminological uh, pseudoscience, et cetera, that doesn't stick with their group. You see, it's, it's this is the predetermination of certain groups in the United States is fundamentally disposable. So it's not only that we understand that, for example, slavery was at the foundation, as Horn argues, right? Is at the very foundation of why something like the Revolutionary War was fought, or at the foundation of how we think of American democracy. The issue is we've created categories then that disown that in our thinking. So our, our notion of democracy disowns that democracy is compatible with enslavement that our American democracy was fought for enslavement, we assume that it was made against it because that's the category we draw in our mind. With feminism, we overlook the imperialism, colonialism, ethnological science that moves into the criminological aspects of the 20th century because the category has to exclude that for us to believe that it's a benevolent and all-inclusive movement. So then when black men then see themselves as being resistant to feminism, we call them misogynists. Instead of understanding that these black men are experiencing the the century long dynamic of white feminists arguing that black men are savage and must be destroyed because they're threats to civilization. So whereas a white man could talk about feminism as an inconvenience to the idea of his privilege or his economic benefits, whatever the case may be, the relationship that black, brown and indigenous men have to Western feminism, white feminism specifically, is a program of imperialism, colonialism and genocide. But these voices have been fundamentally excluded even though we know that patterns of domestic violence, child abuse, et cetera, don't fit what feminists predicted will be given their arguments about patriarchy. The majority of the perpetrators of child abuse in the United States are women. In a black race, the majority of people, and black men kill, black, uh, kill children as well, but the majority of the perpetrators of, of child uh, homicide are women. So then, so then when we ask ourselves, well, then why are we not interested in the issue and why are we more interested in rationalizing or confirming the bias of the category, black men are black, bad, black men are killers of women, children, et cetera. Why does that become the determining interpretive lens we use to view all social problems in history? And see, that's what, in my work, that's what I try to point out that feminism has done. 
it solidified the idea of a barbarous, savage male, black male, that doesn't deserve freedom. And you can find this throughout their writings, all the way from the 1800s practically to the 1980s. So insofar as that's the argument, why then do we pick that up in the, in the work of someone like a bell hooks, right? Why does Kimberly Crenshaw cite Williams and Holmes second assault positively in her arguments on mapping the margins? Why is she citing Susan Brown Miller without any challenge to subculture of violence theory? Why is she making claims about disproportionate rates of domestic violence that affect women with no mention of the male victims, right? So what, what is it in the theories and this kind of telling of history that allow us to buy into certain conceptualizations of groups that then remain unquestioned and even worse now, uncontested? Yeah, and, and not to, to belabor this point, but uh, one of the things we focus on, we focused a lot on the show is the family policing system, which is often mm -hmm. referred to the child welfare system. Is there empirical data that you think is relevant to this point that talks about uh, violence of Black children, particularly Black males in yes. foster care? And, and is there a relationship with to that, to this discussion, and also to the history of anti-Blackness, but particularly anti-Black men? Yeah, I mean, the, the foster care system is extremely violent, as you know. Um, you know, in the man, not the research that I did, uh, really was trying to survey the outcomes of Black males put in foster care, uh, because it was, it was a, for me, it was an example of this, how the social demonization, the cultural belief of Black men as savage, barbarous, and violent really affects the way that people bond or whether or not a Black male child is wanted. So many Black men find themselves to be aged out. They're the most unwanted group, the least likely to be adopted in the foster care system, right? The effect of this, of course, is depression, anxiety, um, higher rates of interpersonal conflict, uh, various behavioral disorders from the emotional trauma of being unwanted, unloved, right? And of course, these are not all necessary. It's not that every Black man that's from this system will exhibit these kinds of issues, but it's that being from this environment of, of being neglected, of being unwanted, of being mistreated, um, produces certain mental health and behavioral outcomes that need to be attended to and uh, need to be treated with compassion. And Black men are never viewed in that way, right? So this, this history of, of abuse, this history of poverty, this history of uh, broken families, right, that many poor Black people experience, not only has the effect of how those people in that situation suffer, but also the children who are displaced from that environment, right? And that's both Black boys and Black girls. But on the Black boy side, what you see are higher incidences of abuse amongst foster parents, a disregard for the child's safety in many uh, arenas, right? And then, of course, the kinds of things that come out of that, which is lack of education, lack of opportunities for employment, which, which, which pushes you know, these young Black men into, into less desirable avenues. You see, the problem here is that we've developed a system, at least, of telling American history, of engaging with the, the racism of social sciences and even theory in such a way that it confirms the identities we choose rather than the actual material artifacts that we're dealing with. What I mean to say by that is we are happy to have intersectional debates about which group or which identity is oppressed or has privilege. But when we are confronted with a question, why are Black boys the least adopted and the most unwanted in foster care systems? Why are Black men exper experiencing the highest rates of unemployment? Why are Black male professors one of the most underrepresented groups? Or out why are they outnumbered by their female counterparts? Wh why do they have the shortest lifespans? Why do they experience equal rates of domestic violence? Right? Why do Black men exhibit practically every kind of gender phenomena that we associate with gender-based violence, even though they're male? We have no answers for this. Why? Not because we can't research it, not because we can't trace it, but because we have no interest in doing so because it upsets our liberal political philosophy and the basis of our gender theory, which suggests that black men, like every other man, have privilege and power. The problem with that is that white men have privilege because they own things. This is, this is Connell's work, right? Hegemonic masculinity. White men control property, media, taxes, wages, government, et cetera. So they don't have to use force. Poor men, black men, brown men, indigenous men don't control any of those things. And that's how we end up with this idea that they use violence. Now, even people like Audre Lorde and Bell Hooks make the same kind of argument. Audre Lorde says black men have privilege precisely because they beat and sexually assault black women. 
Bell Hook says that black men have uh, de can't delay gratification, that they use sexual assault and domestic violence to protect their manhood. Of course, there's no such citations on these kinds of things, but nonetheless, they carry so much cultural currency that they become the intuitive ideations of, of academics and generations of scholars, you know, work on these kinds of topics. One of the reasons that we don't have a lot of good uh, scholarship on domestic violence, and we're really looking largely at national data sets, is because we don't have anyone that really, any body black that really studies domestic violence. They'll study black women who are victims of domestic violence, but there's, there's practically no one that studies black men as victims of domestic violence, despite every single study we have from 76 to now showing that black men are equal and in some cases have greater incidences or prevalences of domestic violence than their female counterparts. So this is, what we often do is we, we, we nail these things down to politics. Oh, it's the politics. No, this is about whether or not we're actually surveying evidence and whether our arguments about race and racism or the history of anti-Blackness in the United States buys into the racist logic we say that we're trying to reject. If you believe that Black men are fundamentally dangerous, fundamentally misogynistic, and fundamentally sexual and, and physical threats to the people in their communities, you are buying into a theory of compensatory masculinity. Because as a blanket fact, the data does not support that Black men are running around killing everybody in their communities and raping everybody. That's not what happened. Now, we do know that Black boys have some of the highest rates of sexual victimization, the earliest ages of statutory rape, some of the highest rates of child sexual abuse. We know that, but we don't ever factor that into how that affects our communities or how it affects the way that we tell history about deviants in our, in our communities. But instead of us doing that, we buy into the liberal white mythology. It's the men that are bad. It's the masculinity that is bad. That Black men, Black men's oppression leads to them oppressing other people. The oppression of black women, well, that leads to democratic votes and great standpoint epistemologies, et cetera. And nobody's allowed to, allowed to ask why. Nobody's allowed to ask, well, why is it that black men seem to be discriminated against more harshly? Why are black boys more unwanted, less likely to be adopted? What is it about being a black male that's been constructed on the backs of criminology and sociology and feminism that has turned the black male into a monster that, did, that repels people and makes Black men exist outside the moral community that everyone else seems to exist, exist in. You see, these are the fundamental driving questions that should motivate us to reinvestigate the historical record and the social scientific record. Instead of us doing that, what ends up happening is asking these questions means that, oh, you're against women. So the question of how do we explain prevalence in domestic violence? How do we explain the unwantedness of black male boy? How do we explain disproportionate rates of child sexual abuse and physical abuse against black boys becomes, oh, well, you don't buy into our ideology. You're not, you don't believe in our identity. So then something's morally wrong with you. You see, and it's, and it's this kind of ideology, right, that freezes us from understanding the complex relationship between history, power, and the colonial ideas that are being imprinted domestically on the minds of black academics and black people more generally. We're continuing to, to, to exist within the continuum of our own you know, degrading. We're constantly making ourselves out to be enemies because we think that the recognition of black men as evil somehow alleviates the racial pressure on every other group. And we ignore data because the data shows that, look, we have a real neighborhood, communal, environmental problem here that requires real resources to solve and not more fancy theories that are talking in continental language to deal with. You see, we want to embrace rhetoric over material analysis. We want, to we want to embrace fairy tales over actual history because it makes it messy. Part of the responsibility here is that if we're looking seriously at the history of feminism, we're not just looking at a movement that's racist, but we're looking at the inception of an origin, a machine, a, an engineering idea that's talking about the ways the structures of society will be allowed to be discussed. Because in protecting the white woman and generating womanhood as a vulnerable category, even under Title VII legislation, it's about the redistribution of economic and educational resources to that group. So when the white women fought to add sex to Title VII, it was precisely based so the black group wouldn't be enriched at the expense of white women. It was a category used to solidify the bond between white men who had power and white women who would now join in that power so that black people didn't interrupt it. And we keep, and even though this isn't the congressional record, it's just, you know, white people for some reason are not very apologetic on the racism they put on record. 
So the fact that you can look this up and it's just in the congressional record somehow has not affected four, five or six generations of scholars from actually asking how does white supremacy regenerate itself, not only in terms of social and material inequality, but also in terms of the theories that we use to talk about and impose this our tribute desire to the black people that we're dealing with. People are invested in believing that black men desire to harm other people. History does not show that. History shows that the author of those theories were insidiously anti-black and specifically anti-black male. But despite the murder and the horror that white feminism has caused around the world, and despite the complacency that some black and, and elitist feminism has also engendered because of buying into these theories, those movements can't be questioned. It's only the poor black men who find themselves either committing crimes for survival or committing crimes off the basis of trauma or harming other people that become held up as the pinnacles and to be tried by history. So you can kill a whole group of people. You can colonize a whole nation. You write centuries of, uh, of, of, uh, of arguments about racial inferiority, but it's the black male criminal that we think has to be held up for moral scrutiny. It's a, it's a ridiculous position that's not only harming how we think, but it's harming how we actually treat this population in America right now. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Those are, I, mean, I could ask you questions until the end of time, but I want to be respectful of your time. Um, yeah. Those are really all the questions I have for you today. Um, is there anything else you want to say before we close? No, I just think, you know, I think it's, you know, I really appreciate you, uh, you know, inviting me to the interview. I think that, you know, it becomes a very difficult thing uh, when black scholars, especially black male scholars begin asking questions and, and building fields to, um, you know, pull back the cloak, so to speak, to pull back the curtain. Uh, you know, one of the things I've always, you know, admired about Horn is just kind of his, his blank statement of fact. <laughs> I guess he's a historian. Uh, but you see this also, you know, people like Derrick Bell, people like Du Bois. Um, you know, I think given where America is right now, there is a real call for honesty. Um, there's a real call for reassessment. And I think that, that what comes with that is, is a renewed call for intellectual courage uh, and asking questions, hard questions about the histories of movements that have been claimed to be about freedom, uh, uh, democracy, uh, and the commitment we have to social equality. When those movements are shown to be insidiously racist, uh, to bring about theories of racial inferiority and to protect white supremacy in a very real sense, we're talking about white women who are deliberately writing from the 19th century all the way throughout the 20th, saying specifically that they are here to build up white superiority, right? When you have that history, that is not something that can be overlooked, right? Because the issue is not the white woman. The issue is how have we bought into movements, language, discourse, ideologies that have been fundamentally dedicated to the elimination or subjugation of a whole groups of black people especially black and brown men, indigenous men. And how then do we then accept that as a language or an idea that we can run with? And while people want to save feminism or make intersexual feminism, whatever the case may be, we have the responsibility to even question how those ideas, right, mm -hmm. participate in the subjugation of racialized men. Black men are held up as the pinnacle of evil throughout Western society, in anti-slave documents, or, or, or pro-slavery documents, and even in, in what we take today to be broadly understood as gender theory. And nobody asks why. Why does the same ideas of Black men exist in contemporary intersectional or, or Black feminist thought, and not all, but some, as existed in ethnological science, white feminism, or criminology? That tells us something about where these ideas are coming from. And a real assessment of history means that we have a responsibility, given the incarceration rates, the premature mortality, right, the death, the police killings of black men, to understand what specific ideas we participate in that seems to lead to the repetitive dehumanization of this group in front of our very eyes. Because there are very few groups that I think we can accept are simply killed for crossing the street, that are killed for speaking out of place, right, that we see with black men and that not spur serious movement and serious revolt. If this was happening to any other group, there would be serious questions asked about the integrity of American democracy. And furthermore, about the actual integrity and moral capacities of individuals who are still saying that black men should be abolished, that black men should be aborted, 
during the period of time where it's most visibly they're being killed by police and white vigilantes. That tells us what our society and our democracy has built consensus around. So I think the question of what feminism is and how it's participated in anti-Black racism is important. But I think the overarching question is, how it has feminism alongside these other racist tropes that we claim we aim to resist, right, as Black intellectuals, become an intimate part of our internal conversations and intellectual heritage. Thank you for beginning to answer a lot of these tough questions and, and adding to um, really important research um, in this area. Um, and again, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, it's been an honor speaking with you um, and hope to have you back again soon. All right, absolutely. Thank you so much.